when I first like realized that I had this drinking problem and I couldn't stop like for me I knew I had to figure out why I had started drinking in the first place and I think that's where a lot of people like they just they look at it as like oh they just started drinking to have fun and now they do it too often well we all are using if you drink too much you're using alcohol to run from something whether it's childhood trauma whether it's emotions like you're using it to hide from something and so I think it's so important for people who don't know what it's like to struggle with it to really go beneath the surface and realize that it's it's not just like a, it's not a choice. Living a life behind a mask, struggling and having to pick up a bottle every day is not something that everybody goes through. And I, for a long time, was nervous to share my story, but now I realize that I have to because there are other people out there like you who desperately need to know that they're not alone in the struggle that they're going through. So if you do one thing for yourself, tell somebody. Tell somebody you trust. Tell somebody you know will understand. I need help and know that it is okay. Because I wish someone would have told me that a lot sooner. So I could have ripped off that mask a lot earlier in my life and gotten to the point I am now for myself and for my kids. Okay, welcome to Living the Next Chapter. Carrie is with me today. Carrie has an amazing story to share. We're going to help a lot of people today by our conversation. I'm excited to have Carrie on the podcast. We're going to take a look at um, not just surviving, but thriving after a big lifetime struggle through alcoholism and, and, and coming out the other side and helping people. And Carrie, I'm so excited to have you on. Carrie McKinney is here on the podcast. Welcome, Carrie, to the podcast. Thank you so much, Dave. I'm so glad to be here. And I love what you said, thriving, not just surviving. Like, that's so good. Okay. All right. So we're already on a good starting point. This is great. So Carrie, we are excited to have you on. This is great. And for those listening, you may hear the occasional tree being ground into bits in the background um, <laughs> where you are. A nice storm has claimed some limbs here and there from trees, by the way. Yes. Only trees. Um, so there's going to be some action in the background. That's always fun, but we're, we're happy to have you here, Carrie. Can you tell everybody where you're joining me from today on the podcast? Yes, I am joining for beautiful Austin, Texas. Last week it was it felt like I was back in Michigan, but today it's like sunny and 75. So I'll take it. So you guys had an ice storm or something. That's crazy. Yeah, we I call it the ice apocalypse. It was unreal. Like everything was covered in ice. Everybody freaks out in Austin when we get any sort of winter weather. So the whole city was just shut down for like four days. The kids didn't go to school for four days. And being from Michigan, you're like, hmm, it's not quite as bad as you think everybody, <laughs> right? Yeah. To that's Whenever we get like snow, it makes me laugh because people are always freaking out, but they're just not prepared here. Like yeah. they don't have the tools to, you know, prepare for the roads and stuff. So it's like, instant ghost town if we get any sort of winter weather it's quite amazing i caught some of the drivers trying to navigate the roads down there when this all happened and it looked like they had no idea how to drive in those kind of conditions so i'm like oh my gosh that's that it's got to be tough i i have no idea how i would react either so i'm glad i'm glad you're safe and i'm glad that we can still do this today thank you for making yes. time good so carrie Take us back a little bit in, in your journey. Of course. Because we talked already, and I loved having this conversation, and I want to bring people up to where we're at right at this point. Take me back, Harry. You, as a mom and, and doing all that stuff, you you were battling something behind the scenes that other people might not have even known that you were battling. Can you kind of take me through that? I like to say that I was I was always a girl who was looking for someone to save her. You know, I was always that like princess in the tower waiting for her Prince Charming to come up on a big white horse and and save her and, and make her so happy. And um, 
from a young age, I, I just was always looking externally for everything. Um, I started drinking when I was 12 years old and quickly realized how easy it was to suppress your emotions using alcohol. And I had big emotions. I'm a very sensitive person, um, big empath. And so I didn't know how to deal with those emotions. So I just started trying to pretend like they weren't there and hiding them behind alcohol. And um, I used alcohol just with everything for most of my life. You know, if I had a social event, I would drink before. If I was going on a date, I would drink before. Like everything revolved around alcohol. And um, I got pregnant unexpectedly when I was 22. Did stop drinking for, you know, that Thankfully, that pregnancy, and I really do, um, I really do say that my son saved me because if I hadn't gotten pregnant, I mean, I was on a very, very, very dark spiral. Um, but then once I got, once the baby came, I instantly picked it back up and started drinking again. And um, you know, from the outside, it looked like I was this thriving um, corporate American woman with you know, with two little kids and climbing the corporate ladder. But inside I was just, I was miserable and I was drinking almost two bottles of wine a night. I don't know how I showed up for work, but I did. And I think it was just my body, like I gotten used to it. Um, And then I finally just, everything caught up to me. And um, I eventually kind of got tired of my own self and got sober. And that's when my, you know, I'd say journey really started. What? What superpower was unlocked for you through alcohol? Oh, gosh. Confidence. It wasn't real confidence, though. It was fake confidence. But it, alcohol, you know, once you take that first drink, it's like you get that warm and fuzzy feeling and you start feeling good. And then it's like you get past two and alcohol starts telling you, you can do anything. You can be anyone. You can be the life of the party. People are going to love you once you continue drinking me. And that's kind of what I did. You know, I, I thought the more that I drank, the more that people would like me. And so I put on this mask of fake confidence with my little champagne glass in my hand and tried to be someone that I wasn't. During that time, like alcohol is so tied into social events, it's tied into family events, weddings, New Year's Eve. Any social event, really, we have just had a a big football game that just happened this past weekend where the commercials are there and it just celebrates Mm -hmm. the freedom to have a drink and it's tied into almost everything that we do. After after work, we're all going to go and, you know, have an after hour thing together, go to a comedy club. What would you like to have to drink? It just kind of like comes at you from every direction. Did, Did that help? Or hinder yeah. you in your path to to finding your way out of all this? No, I mean, that's definitely why it took me so long to get sober. Um, and I like to say alcohol is the norm and sobriety is the exception. And that is what we have to change. We have to flip that wow. script. When I, my first job out of college, I was working for um, a management training program with a well-known car rental company. If anyone has ever um, done the management training program, you know what I'm talking about. And Dave, every single day we went to happy hour after. And like that was how we were rewarded for our hard work was to go to happy hour and have our drinks paid for. And then as I continued working in corporate America, it continued to happen. And drinking was always part of my family, um, you know, events and gatherings too. I mean, I grew up with an alcoholic father. My grandpa was an alcoholic. It definitely runs in my family. And so it was always around. It's all that I knew. And there were a few times over the years that I tried to get sober. But at the end of the day, I just kept going back to it and back to it because it was such a huge part of my life. And I really couldn't imagine doing half of the things that I was, you know, doing, attending the events that I was going to, if I didn't have a drink, even going out to dinner, right? Like 
going out to dinner and ordering a glass of champagne had just become second nature to me. Like I couldn't imagine what I'm like, what am I going to do if I go out to dinner? What am I going to drink? It was, it was very sad, truthfully. And that's, and that's the thing that I like, so I I just, I'm just kind of wondering from a point of view for somebody who maybe doesn't drink and doesn't understand how hard this is. Like if you're not a drinker and you you don't participate at all Mm -hmm. and you're just thinking, well, it just must be that easy. I I don't drink, so it's not a big deal for me. So why would it be such a big deal for you? And maybe there's just an an impression that from that perspective, not drinking, that this is maybe a weakness for you, that you're just, you're just using alcohol as a crutch or it's just the way you get through life. And because I don't have that, Speaking as someone else, by the way, I don't feel, I don't drink, so I don't have that concern. I don't understand how powerful this is. I, I would just think you just got to be a stronger person like me who doesn't drink. Again, I'm talking as someone else, as someone who doesn't drink. And mm-hmm. I just think you should just, just be better. Yeah. Like, can't you just be better? Like, I, I don't understand why this is such a hard thing to deal with. What would you say to somebody in their ignorance who just doesn't understand? How do you how do you respond to that? It's such it's such a good question. And um until you truly struggle with addiction, I don't think anyone will ever fully be able to understand the depth of how hard it really is to stop. And when I first like realized that I had this this drinking problem and I couldn't stop, like for me I knew I had to figure out why I had started drinking in the first place. And I think that's where a lot of people like, they just, they look at it as like, oh, they just started drinking to have fun and now they do it too often. Well, we all are using, if you drink too much, you're using alcohol to run from something, whether it's childhood trauma, whether it's emotions, like you're using it to hide from something. And so I think it's so important for people who don't know what it's like to struggle with it to really go beneath the surface and realize that it's it's not just like a it's not a choice. I mean, once your brain starts using this coping mechanism, that's what it holds on to. And um when I finally did get sober, I was so interested in how it affected my brain and my mind that I took a course through Stanford University called the Psychology of Recovery and Addiction just to learn everything I could about like what was this drug doing to my brain and it's amazing how it literally changes the pathways you know in your brain that when you go through something hard or you start feeling an emotion it's like your brain is triggered that's what I need to make myself feel better is alcohol and um, until you can learn to rewire your brain and, and change those neural pathways, you're always going to continue going down that same path. It's a tricky, tricky drug. So with that knowledge that you have now, what would you say to the 23-year-old Carrie listening to this podcast who is stuck and can't find their way out of the bottle? What would you, with this new knowledge, what would you say to that version of Carrie? Had you had the opportunity to talk to her at 23? Oh, gosh. Poor, poor 23-year-old Carrie. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, I, first would, I first would tell her that you don't have to do it alone. And I think, you know, it's okay to admit that you have a problem. Um, but I, I think the second thing I would say is, what are you running from? You know, what... Is it that made you start drinking in the first place? And it's once once I realized what was happening to my brain when I started when I would drink, it was like a light bulb clicked for me. And so now when I even work with women who want to stop drinking, we talk about what happens in your brain and really, you know, where those cravings are coming from. Because I personally believe that the more people who understand exactly, you know, what is happening inside your your mind, it makes it so much easier to, I don't want to say it makes it easier to quit because it's not easy to quit, but when you teach your brain exact, when you teach yourself what's happening, 
it's easier to get a handle on it because you know exactly what's going on. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. You talked about the superpower that you got from drinking in, in adding confidence. Mm -hmm. What's the superpower that you have now that you are past this point in your life and alcoholism is behind you? Now, what is your superpower? Love. It really is. Love and compassion. Hmm. I, I had to learn. I did a lot of stupid stuff when I was drinking. Like Dave, the amount of memories that I have and, and guilt. And I actually did a little ritual with myself a couple days ago where I wrote down every item that I was still holding any sort of guilt or shame or hatred towards myself around. They were all, they 90% of them were all when I was drinking. And I had to learn how to show myself so much love and compassion because of the things that I did when I was not aware of what I was doing. And now I have just such an undescribable amount of love and compassion toward everybody else in my life too, whether they're struggling or not, because I know that we're all just doing the best we can with, with, where we are in life, you know? On the other side now, that looking back, do you have like um do you have like a radar where you can sense other people who are struggling, maybe with alcohol or with something, but there's just some signals, there's something that you're 100%. just like, I feel it. You talk about love and empathy. You have that heart for that person, you can tell there's mm -hmm. something not the way it should be. Do you sense that when you're around people? 100%. Yes. And at first, um, when I started really realizing that I could sense this, this struggle that people have, I can instantly tell when someone has a drinking problem. The, the fixer in me, the codependent, um, instantly wanted to help and instantly would start reaching out. So, Carrie... We talk about the struggle about when you were living this. We talk about how you can sense this in people. I would say that this is also part of your superpower, is that empathetic ability to see past the smoke and mirrors that we put up to hide our addiction and that you can see through that. Have you? Do you have any examples of being able to to be there for somebody? when they needed someone who could see through the facade that they were trying to hide behind? Have you been able to help somebody? Yeah. I mean, um, my, so my, my last, um, partner. Um, so part of my story, I've been married and divorced twice and, um, I married my first husband, the father of my children, very, um, young. And then I, um, we got divorced and I was married a second time. And my second husband, we, um, it was a very intense relationship and it was a very, um, almost trauma bonded type of relationship because we were both alcoholics. And, um, I, you know, for the first beginning and parts of our relationship, like that was what our relationship was built around was just drinking together. And, because of that, we would have really intense fights. The highs would be really high. The lows would be really low. And um, then we started getting we started getting sober together. Well, I thought we had started getting sober together. And um, about nine months after I thought we were sober, I had discovered, I had realized that he wasn't. And I had just I had just sensed it. And then finally I was I had the proof. And, um, it was, it was so amazing to me. Who is this making me emotional? Um, my reaction when I found out that he had been hiding his drinking from me, um, you know, old Carrie, when I was drinking would have gone off and screamed and how could you do this to me? How could you lie to me? But I didn't. I had this, this 
immense amount of compassion and love pouring over me for him because I knew how hard he was struggling. I knew how hard it was to quit. And, you know, I, I just, all I kept saying was, I'm here for you. I'm here to support you. Like you need help. I want to get you help. And again, you can't help someone who doesn't want to be helped. So that was another big wake up call for me. But it was in that moment where I'm like, people need a safe space to go when they're struggling. People need someone that they can talk to who won't judge them. And when you grow up in families where, you know, you have to have this perfect persona and you have to wear this mask and I'm successful and no one in my family could ever have a drinking problem, it makes it extra hard for those people to reach out and say, hey, I need help. And so part of the work that I do now is really helping women um, and men if they want help. I mean, mostly work with women, but I don't discriminate against anyone, but it's like, if you're struggling and you don't know where to go and you have no one to talk to, I am here. I'm here to help you and talk to you and, and empathize with you in a way that is really hard to do unless you've gone through the struggle yourself. Carrie, if somebody could push a button on the keyboard, a little delete button there, and delete all of the stuff that's happened with alcohol from 12 years of age through your journey, and one click of a button could just remove all that from your story as if it never happened. No. Would you want them to push that button? I'm not at all. Why? Because I cannot help the people that need help unless I go through everything that I did. I can't help that mom hmm. who is sitting at home after putting her kids to bed, just drowning herself in the bottle. I can't help that upper middle class woman who is in a VP level role at a big tech company, but every time she checks out, she goes and pours herself a vodka soda. I can't help these people and I can't hold space for them unless I went through all of the really, really, really hard that I did. And yeah. it took me a long time to be okay with that. And it was all about bringing up every single decision that I had made in the past while I was drinking and learning to love it and still love myself in those moments. And it was hard. So we talked about this and I love your perspective on this. You wouldn't consider yourself to be a coach, right? Mm -mm. No. I stay away from the word. Okay, so can you explain to me how you preface this? Because I think your version of how you see yourself as someone who can help people, as something that's more than just semantics about how to say the word, but you've moved from something that's overused and abused, the word coach, into something I think that's more effective. Can you explain? So I like to call myself a mentor. Um, and, and even a guide, I'll I usually like to use the words mentor and a guide, because when I think about a coach, I think there are a lot of amazing coaches out there, but when I think of a coach, I think of like a fitness coach. If I go to the gym, I'm going to go find a personal trainer who's a fitness coach who can tell me exactly what I need to do to get into shape. But when it comes to this type of work, when it comes to healing yourself from alcoholism and childhood trauma and finding self-love, I can't tell anybody word for word how to do this. I can guide them in the direction that they need to go to work on themselves. I can ask them the questions that they need to be asking themselves to really dig deep and connect with their, their soul and their intuition and to dig up those pieces that they're running from. But I can never tell anyone what to do. And so that's why I really, really like to call myself a self-love mentor, spiritual guide, because that's what I'm doing. I'm guiding people towards this new way of living that is all about taking their power back and taking con back complete control of their life. So, Carrie, I love how we've kind of framed the rest of this conversation because we're going to talk about your author journey and what you've been working on and your message through to the world through your words. And... I'm excited to talk about that as well. 
Can you tell us a little bit about the book that you were co-authoring? And specifically, you have your chapter, I love the title, A Bottle Filled with Lies. <laughs> so the fact we've had this great conversation leading up to this, now yeah. let's focus in on the book. And what is your message and why did you write this chapter? So the book is called Depression Lied to Me. And I, I was so, so honored to be a part of it because it really it takes a different perspective from what depression has looked like for 14 women. And we each have our own struggles with depression, but mine was really, really um, influenced by alcohol. And so my, my, um, my chapter really gives readers a glimpse into some of the hardest moments of my life that I struggled with um, addiction. And, you know, those moments where, after I had my first child, I was very close to getting um, addicted to prescription pills, different kind of bottle, but still a bottle um, because I couldn't, mm. I couldn't drink yet. I, I was still breastfeeding. So I just, I used the, the Percocet that I was prescribed, um, you know, for the, the birth pain. And, um, and then it, it kind of, it kind of goes into a little bit more just about some of the ridiculous mistakes I made while drinking and how I thought that alcohol was helping my depression and, and it instead was doing the exact opposite because they're a dangerous, dangerous mix. And then um, in the last part of my chapter, I actually, I share um, a moment that I had with my youngest son when we were driving in the car and it was after I had moved out um, with it was after my last husband and I split and I had moved out of the big house that we shared and he said to me he said mom did you used to cry a lot in the bathroom when we lived at the old house and I was so taken back by this question because my bathroom had been my safe haven and I did I cried there all the time I would go there when I was feeling depressed when I was feeling suicidal when I was feeling anything. And I always thought that, I, you know, no one could hear me. I was in my own little cave when I was in this bathroom. And to know that he had heard this and experienced this, I, I got very emotional, but I also was filled with so much gratitude mm -hmm. that he was never going to have to see his mom in that condition again because I was sober. So it was a very, very powerful moment with him that he has no idea how powerful it really was until he gets a lot older. Uh, how is how has your kids seen your path and your development? What lessons have they learned watching their mom go through this and come out on the other side and now want to help other people? What kind of things are they seeing in you that inspire, that you hope will inspire them in their future? Oh, Dave, I, I cannot express to you how much better my relationship is with my kids. And, um, I had, I had a lot of guilt that I had to get over from when they were younger and I was still in my heavy drinking days. I mean, they were never in danger. Don't get me, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. Like they were always supported and had what they needed. And, but when you are addicted to alcohol, it numbs your emotions. You have very low emotional intelligence and you have a very hard time showing emotions a lot of the times. And so they weren't loved how they should have been. They weren't loved unconditionally like every child needs to be. And once I got sober, I realized how much affection and attention they had lost because I would always need to make sure I had a drink or I was passed out at 9 30 because I needed to have I drank too much and my relationship with them now is I cannot imagine a better relationship like my 13 year old 13 loves to hug me he talks to me about everything and to know that I'm here so mm. present and emotionally stable in some of the hardest years of their lives, that in itself keeps me going to never, ever want to pick up a bottle again. 
And I just, it's changed my life so much that I, I can't even, like, if you are a parent listening and you're struggling with alcohol, use your kids as the one motivation if you need anything to get sober. Because it really does not only change your life, but it changes the lives of your kids more than more than you know. Have you had a conversation with your 13-year-old about alcohol and what alcohol can do? I am very open with both of them. So my, my oldest is 13, my youngest is 11, and they know that mom used to have a drinking problem. They know that I no longer drink. They know how I feel about how society portrays alcohol. And I talk very openly about them. I think it's very important. They know that I don't want them around people who are drunk. Um, and I actually talk to them about um, how much it runs in my family and that they know that their grandpa struggled. They know that my grandpa struggled. And my um, 11 year old last year, when he was still 10, he said to me, we were talking about family history and he goes, so it sounds like I have a very good chance of having a drinking problem too. And I'm like, yes, buddy, Whoa. you do. And he goes, he looks at me and goes, I'm going to be the first person in our family to never drink alcohol. And I'm like, yes, yes. Like <laughs> you keep that vision and you keep that goal for yourself because that is what we need more of. I mean, who knows if he'll really follow through with it, you know, when he gets older. And But even to just know that yeah. my words were impacting him and he was understanding what I was saying, no one had that, that conversation with me when I was younger. No one would have even thought that it was important. It was amazing. And that's why I love having a podcast, Carrie, is we can now put this out into the world. Someone will find this title, will find your name or... Somehow they'll come to this episode, they're listening to us right now, and they're here. They've been with us since the beginning of the podcast. They're still here with us right now. They're listening to you, and they're connecting with you and your story. And having a podcast just opens that door that somebody can listen to this five, ten years from now and still hear you addressing them and speaking directly to them. So I'm stepping back from the microphone, Carrie. And I would love for you to talk to them directly. I want you to share your your thought with that person who's at a very tough spot in their life. They feel alone. They don't they fooled everybody, Carrie, except themselves. They are they need help. And they need to hear from you. So I'm backing away and I want you to talk to them as if I'm not even here. What do you want to say to them? In addition to all the great stuff we've already talked about, what would you like to say to them in this moment, knowing what it feels like and helping them to make one step away from the bottom? You know, you don't have to live like this forever. And no matter what you're going through, no matter what mistakes you've made in the past, no matter what bad decisions you think that you have chosen that made you end up where you are today, things can always be different. You can always change the narrative. Your past does not define who you are in the present moment. And it's okay to ask for help. You're always going to have people who don't understand you and don't understand what you're going through. But there are people out there who do. And those are your people. Those are the people that you need to find and you need to reach out to and you need to surround yourself with. Because living a life behind a mask, struggling and having to pick up a bottle every day is not something that everybody goes through. And I, for a long time, was nervous to share my story. But now 
I realize that I have to because there are other people out there like you who desperately need to know that they're not alone in the struggle that they're going through. So if you do one thing for yourself, tell somebody, tell somebody you trust, tell somebody you know will understand, I need help and know that it is okay. Because I wish someone would have told me that a lot sooner. So I could have ripped off that mask a lot earlier in my life and gotten to the point I am now for myself and for my kids. Carrie, I love how open you are to talk about this. You're just like, this is who I am. And this is, this is my message for the world. And you're not hiding this message because again, the people, when I talk to people as guests, I firmly believe everyone has a story and every story can help at least one person in this world. So for you to come out and, and, and be available to speak on this podcast and share your story. I know, mm-hmm. I know there's no, there's no way that this story is not going to impact somebody. And if all of our time and effort culminates in someone listening to this going, I need help and I need, I need to, to do something about this that I feel like our combined efforts to make this happen is well worth the time. 100%. So thank you for making time to do this. Thanks. You know, um, I love the fact that we can talk about yeah. this, especially when somebody feels like they can't talk to anybody. There so. are so many people out there, Dave, who on the outside, they look like they have their life completely together, but on the inside and when they go home, they are literally dying inside. It is an epidemic that we have, and we have to start getting people comfortable reaching out and speaking up more because that's the only way that the ripple effect is going to happen and more people are going to be able to get the help they need. It's amazing. So, Carrie, you've taken your journey. You've helped to contribute to this book. Thank you for doing that. You are a mentor and a guide to help people, and you are working on new things as well, which I'd love to kind of talk about as we close off. You're helping people in the business sense to help avoid burnout and you're creating something to help people about this. Can you talk a little bit about this and maybe a little bit about your, your website as a resource? Because I can anticipate people are going to want to talk to you about a a number of things, but let's talk about your avoiding burnout thing that you're working on to help people. I'm interested about that. Yeah. I mean, I realized, I mean, I worked in the corporate world for 10 years. I, all while I was drinking heavily and I, I, I used my job and the validation of other people that I worked with to really give me that fulfillment that I was looking for. And I realized I was living it completely wrong. And so I created this employee wellness workshop to really help employees recognize when they're on the verge of burnout, what to do to get ahead of it, what to do if you're already at that point, and really how to how to bring more mindfulness into your everyday life so that you don't get to the point where you want to completely jump ship because you're so miserable from never taking care of yourself. So I'm very, very excited about this, um, this offering that I have. Um... And then like you mentioned, the website, um, I have a women's circle that I'm um, really excited to launch uh, next month for um, just for women who really struggle with things like anxiety, depression, codependency, drinking too much, whatever it is, anyone who wants to just take back their power and just start living differently. That's what this is going to be for. Um so I'm I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity that I'm in right now to be able to to help inspire other women to take back their power too, because it is not an easy thing to do. And I learned the hard way that you don't have to do it alone. We're not meant to do it alone. From survival to thrive, right? You're thriving. And I love I love how you've taken something that yeah. was meant to harm you and destroy your future. And now you're helping somebody by reaching into their lives and helping them. So it's an amazing story. Thank you. Thank you very much. Carrie, I love our, I love our conversation. I'm following with great 
interest and anticipation of amazing things to come. Thank you. And I know you're going to help many people. Thank you for sharing a portion of that with us and with, with the audience here living the next chapter because you are living that next chapter. And I, I love, I love that we can tie that all together because yes. you're showing it every day. Now you're doing yes. this. It's a completely different one. All the best to you and your kids. Thank you. Right. All the best to you, your kids. I, I know they're proud of you. And, um, I'm proud of our conversation, so thank you for making time. Thank you, Dave. Thank you so much. Jumping here at the very end, I want to thank you for coming. We have listeners around the world, and I got to tell you, as a podcaster, it is so great to hear back from the people who listen to the show. Now, you are still here. The podcast's over. Like we're sweeping up and putting the chairs away. You're still here. So, hi. I would love to talk to you. No, no, I really, really would. I would love to hear your voice. I would love to hear from you through email. You can do all that at livingthenextchapter.com. I say it fast because I love it. Living the Next Chapter. It's the name of the podcast. Dot com. How's that for easy? Right? Right. So come on over there and let's have a conversation. You can set up time in my calendar. You can air quote here, book. <laughs> book time in my calendar. Book. Next chapter. Let's have a conversation. Thanks for being here. See you on the next one. Cheers. MindShift Power Podcast, the podcast for teenagers and those who work with them. There's a huge problem in America today. There's a very large disconnect between teenagers and the adults who work with them. I'm looking to bridge that gap with real, raw, honest conversation, not held back by the chains of political correctness. You cannot solve a problem you do not understand. Want to understand teenagers today? Listen to this podcast. This podcast is for teens in the U.S. and Canada. To learn more, go to FatimaBay.com slash podcast, or just look for MindShift Power Podcast on any listening platform. I look forward to you being a faithful listener.